I see Langdon Mitchell's 1906 play, The New York Idea, as the bookend to the first century of American comedy, in particular, American satiric comedy, starting in the late 18th century with something like Royal Tyler's The Contrast, and then ending here in the early 20th century before the advent of modernism and real American dramatic realism with somebody like Eugene O'Neill. So here are my bookends for the first century of American comedy. I'm talking specifically about American theatrical satire, even more specifically about a kind of satire, comedy of manners, which I'll explain in a little bit. But Royal Tyler's The Contrast in 1787, that's our first canonical American play. It isn't actually the first American satire. Something like I don't know, Robert Munford's The Candidates might be a potential candidate for that, but it's the first really good one. That's why it's in our canon. And so that's in 1787, and then The New York Idea is one of the last really good American comedies in this specific satirical mode. Both The Contrast and The New York Idea are examples of a specific kind of theatrical comedy, a specific kind of theatrical satire known as comedy of manners. Like a lot of literary terms, comedy of manners has a specific historical application and then a much broader application that is how people actually use it. So comedy of manners, technically speaking, comedy of manners is meant to refer to plays of the English Restoration, the inauguration of Charles II, that sort of thing. The best of which I think is The Way of the World by William Congreve. In its most broad application, the term comedy of manners can refer to any satirical drama that pokes fun at uh, social conventions or codes. It, some of the stylistic features of comedy of manners are the presence of a lot of jeu d'esprit. Uh, comedy of manners uses really exaggerated forms of common social characters. So somebody like a fop or the obsequious servant or a superannuated spinster. These kinds of things are very common in a comedy of manners. I don't want to give the impression that comedy of manners is a term used to refer to any play that satirizes social conventions or mores. The manners in the phrase comedy of manners, the thing that's being satirized, are the rules of polite society in Europe and then later imported into America from, say, the 17th century up into uh, America up until the Gilded Age. The comedy of manners pokes fun at, really attacks, the rules of high society by stretching them to their extreme. In doing so, a comedy of manners shows how arbitrary they are. I would say that the New York idea draws from the lineage of the fallen woman in that it addresses the question, what happens when a woman picks the wrong man to marry but can just divorce him whenever she wants and pick another man? The idea, so the New York idea is about divorce. The idea in the title is New York's particular idea about marriage. And the joke is that in New York, you can marry on a whim and then leave it for the divorce courts to figure it out from there. The message of the New York idea, I didn't fully grasp this until I started shooting this video. The final message of the New York idea is that it's too easy to get a divorce in Edith Wharton's Gilded Age in New York. And so the two most sympathetic characters, arguably the two protagonists, who are divorced at the beginning of the play end up getting back together at the end of the play. So the New York idea says it was too easy for them to get, to get a divorce in the first place. They were in love the whole time. It, it's a very melodramatic ending. It's a holdover from the melodrama here, I mean, as a genre of theater. Melodrama was the prevailing mode of theater in the 19th century. And the end of the New York idea is a holdover from that. It's very melodramatic. Because it's so unlikely that these two characters would have a happily ever after, the end of Langdon Mitchell's play can seem kind of silly to audiences today. And a lot of a comedy of manners is going to seem silly, in part because it, a lot of it's supposed to. The comedy of manners is mocking people, and so they're going to be portrayed, the people who are being satirized are going to be portrayed as silly. But it's also in part because manners change from era to era. So what seemed like kind of common sense good breeding in 1906, or even more so in 1787, what seemed like the natural way that people would act in high society now to us in the 21st century seems kind of silly. This is a good example of how artificial these kinds of rules and conventions are. They seem silly to us now because they've changed. Ideas about divorce have changed, although anxiety about the national divorce rate is still prevalent in our society, but I, ideas about divorce have changed, and so the central message of the New York idea that it's too easy to get a divorce does kind of doesn't really, uh, kind of strikes a false note with us now.
This is why having context is so important in evaluating a satire and, in particular, a comedy of manners. Because without context, you're not going to know which parts of the play are supposed to be silly and which parts you're supposed to take seriously. In The New York Idea, it's supposed to be silly that the characters are brought notes on a little silver tray by their servants. That's, that's supposed to seem silly. But the end of the play that seems so silly to us now, you're supposed to take that seriously. In fact, the whole point of the New York idea is communicated in that final moment. The idea that it's too easy to get a divorce in Gilded Age, Edith Wharton, New York, that's communicated in that final part, and without context, you're not going to know whether it's a sincere move or whether it's also part, part, part of the satire. You need context in order to assess these comedies. With that context, looking at it through the lens of the social conventions of 1906 New York, you can determine that Langdon Mitchell's play is successful, is canon-worthy, I, I would say for two reasons. One, it's really funny. It's supposed to be funny. It's a comedy of manners. It succeeds in being funny. It's quite amusing once you're able to take it on its own terms. Two, Langdon Mitchell, as far as I can tell, Langdon Mitchell is the first great writer of stage directions in the history of American theater. Writing stage directions is its own kind of craft. There are dramatists who had clearly labored over their stage directions, but a lot of it is very just kind of matter of fact. It's not, it's not meant to be great writing, it's just supposed to help the person who stages the play figure out what the characters are supposed to be doing. But Langdon Mitchell's stage directions go beyond that. They approach the quality of someone like Jay and Barry. At some point in the play, one of the characters, I can't remember which one, one of the characters is, feels like he's being judged, I think it's a male, feels like he's being judged, and so he gestures towards the whole censorious universe. Uh, my favorite one, there's a, a point in which one of the women says something with velvet sarcasm. Velvet sarcasm. I just, I think that's great. So it's on the basis of its humor and of these really great stage directions that I think Langdon Mitchell's The New York Idea deserves to be in the canon and is in fact in our canon.